Good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for the invitation. Nobody knows what's going to happen now, not even myself. I was wondering when I received the invitation, uh, what can I possibly tell you about productivity that you don't already know? And I'm not sure whether what you will hear from me is actually new to you. Uh, it's going to be an experiment, so please bear with me. I want to start with an anecdote. As you may or may not know, I happen to be a <coughs> philosopher. Can you hear me? Can you hear me good? Okay. However, last fall I had a job as an interim professor as, uh, at a well-known business school in Germany, which is weird for a Marxist, uh, a private university that aims to be different from anybody else. For example, I as a philosopher was not teaching philosophy, I was teaching, I was substituting a sociology professor, but this sociology professor did not teach sociology either, he taught economics. So I was filling in a sociologist in order to do some economics as a philosopher, which is weird. And you can imagine that the philosopher giving in a class on economics uh, is not the usual thing, something weird, something disturbing maybe. And it was exactly this uh, understanding of unusual or innovative dimension to something uh, that was what the private university was selling, actually. It was this difference or this creativity in a certain way that uh, made the difference and in that term was understood to be productive. Uh, in fact, that already touches two different meanings of productivity uh, that I want to distinguish as a first move. Um, let's imagine the image of an apple tree. The tree, which of course is a symbol for wisdom, but also for sin and for all kinds of things. The tree is productive in the literal sense. It produces apples. The apples have not been there before. They only exist because the tree transforms some water and soil into this fruit. This, however, is not the productivity that the private university was after. In this understanding, it would be sufficient in the apple tree productivity understanding it would be sufficient to have the average economics professor lecture about the history of economic thinking with a message that you could hear at any other university with 200 students in the class and for free. And also it will be the same as last year and next year and next year. It will always be the same. As in the apple tree, nothing new is happening here. It's the same procedure as every year, in case you know dinner for one, I'm not sure. So you see already, um, the first notion of productivity rather means reproduction. It's not really producing something new, it's reproducing what was already there, as in the tree, the apples have been there last year. So it's the same apples every year. It's steady, reliable, it sounds natural. For some people in the 80s, it also sounded female, <laughs> but I skipped that debate, it's very complicated. Um, this is why this reproductive element is why Hannah Arendt, for example, neglected the, the term of labor. For her, the problem was exactly this, that work or labor only reproduces the daily necessities. So it's reproduction, nothing new comes out. Whereas production, herstellen in German, is the real thing, the good thing, because here something new and valuable is created. And this second meaning of creativity or productivity is not related to nature, conceptually, but rather to reason, maybe technology, maybe in the 80s one might have said it is male for some reason, I'm not going to go into this. Uh, in any case, it is productive because it increases the amount of goods, it's more than it was before. Um, so it's intrinsically, you could say, related to growth, it's growing. And we will see that there are some political implications to this difference, productivity as natural and productivity as something that is technical and growth related, that has political implications, very, very deep ones. And maybe I should add, of course, one big difference between private universities and the public universities is that the private universities do that for profit. That's a very high tuition and um, that's why it's counted as productive in the economic terms. Now this experience I had at the business school explains why I, as a philosopher, do not talk to you tonight about uh, the philosophical meaning of productivity. That would be possible. In Kant, for example, productive imagination is very, I think, very important term that has a bearing not only on romanticism but also on Marx's terms of non-economic productivity. I think that's a romantic notion that has very 
interesting relations to German idealism. Um, but, uh, and what I wanted to say is that the Frankfurt School still somehow uses this alternative term of productivity whenever it comes to a criticism of economics. But in order to fully grasp the political function of this third meaning of productivity, which is the romantic one, non-economic, some kind of produce the true good of uh, the human being and all of this, maybe Aristotelian, in order to understand this third meaning, let me first elaborate the other two economic ones a little bit more detailed. And now what I'm going to do is go back to the lecture. This is why you see some pictures here. I, I just represent to you what I presented to this business university, and that's the experiment here. Um, I represent in a, in a short overview what I told them and try to get the, the meaning of productivity most clearly. What struck me when I reread all the classical texts again after many years was the inherent violence of the economic theory and of the term productivity in particular. It is a very violent term if you, if you have a look at it more closely. Having a look at the history of the discipline is a good exercise in this regard because it allows you to question the usual assumptions that are taken for granted in the regular economics curriculum. So if you study economics, you will not see the violence, maybe, so clearly. One of the key assumptions of the usual way to study economics, and I think this assumption is deeply wrong, is the assumption that economics is about scarcity. So economics, we, we need economics in order to overcome scarcity. Once you assume that everything is scarce, that we never have enough, the one who is the most productive is the good guy, of course, because he provides every, even ever more goods and services to everybody. Hence, increasing productivity and growth is a good thing, and it needs to be fostered at all costs. Even if it increases inequality at the same time, waste and pollution and all of these social costs. <coughs> this is the picture that you have um, in economics classes, I think, whether it's private or uh, public schools. And maybe, um, if you have a look at the history of economic thought, though, you do not find this notion of scarcity. That's one of the differences that you uh, experience. It's rather the notion of affluence that, has, that is at the beginning. Um, instead of productivity and growth, you have a notion of fullness. <coughs> and so the, the first thing that you find if you go into the history is this. This is what I wanted to show you. Do you know these guys? Still, these are uh, Fred Flintstone, I think is his name. Um, he lives in the Stone Age, supposedly a very poor uh, economy because they didn't have any industry, but they are happy. So what you find here is complacency. People are actually satisfied with what they have, even though it's not enough. So, but there's no scarcity in the beginning, right? This is, this is the message. In fact, early societies were ones of fullness or affluence, as it was later called. And this is something that you can show uh, maybe a little bit more theoretical if you go into this book. Stone Age economics. I'm not going to do it now because it's, I could do it, but uh, it takes too long, I think. Uh, he shows how many hours in a day uh, the Stone Age people uh, were actually working. Food related activity, he calls it. And you can see there that it's about three to five hours a day. So if you calculate that, uh, let's say four hours, that's, that's a 20 hour work week, right? And then he has also he has a look um, at the use of the spare time that they have, and they sleep. If they have some statistic in this book. What do they do with their spare time? They sleep over the daytime. I mean, sometimes two hours a day, sometimes three, sometimes only one, but then maybe four. Sometimes they go to work, like hunting, for eight hours and then come back. But uh, usually, um, it's like a 20 hours a week. And that also tells you something about productivity, because um, they could have gone hunting for 40, for 40 hours. They could have caught more fish, picked more food, but there was no need for it. So there was no need to increase productivity to be more efficient or something, because people were happy with what they had. So you didn't have productivity growth, but uh, you didn't have scarcity either. And that's something that is quite um, distorting, because it it questions the very foundation of economic theory, that there's no scarcity in the beginning. And I think insights like this 
are one of the reasons why economic history, the history of economic thinking, is no part of the economic curriculum any longer. I mean, at least in the universities I know, it used to be part of the economics uh, curriculum, it no longer is. You only find it in history, and so it's, now it's the history guys who do history of economics, and maybe philosophers like me who are interested in old, old school economics, but that's about it. And I think the reason for this is because it questions uh, the contemporary assumptions that are taken for granted. Now, if you go into the history of economics as a science, this is only economics as a practice, right? What did people do, actually, uh, 5,000 years ago? What did they do for a living? Go hunting and sleep, <laughs> which is funny. But uh, history of economics as a science, I think it's noteworthy that in the beginning, and I would say that's Aristotle, there's no growth at all either. No growth. He's talking about productivity in, in a sense, but he only means uh, the reproductive sense, that means the household that needs to reproduce itself. And this kind of work is done by others. So instead of working, one should learn to live a good life. Education is very important. And use the given resources wisely, spend it on education, for example, but not on luxury goods. So don't spend it on expensive cars, rather spend it on your education. And that's, again, one of these distorting things, because the private university that I was working at was using the same rhetorics. Could have been from Aristotle. So, uh, confusing in a, in a certain sense. Um, but, of course, what you can learn from Aristotle, too, is that um, whenever you can introduce a telos, or a reason why you have economics, it has a certain end. And with this end, which is the good life, which includes education and virtue and all of this stuff, um, you do not need growth, because if you reach that end, that's enough, okay? So you can, to this limit, you can have some kind of economic activity, but then you stop if you have enough and do other things. That's the main reason, um, I think, um, at least that's what the economic history perspective is, why you do not have growth in ancient Greece, at least not reflected in the theory. The first time that the notion of growth comes in is mercantilism. And you see, now I'm going with you, through the history of economic thought, I, I hope that's bearable for you. Um, mercantilism, that's the school in the 15th, 16th, 17th century. Um, theoretically, however, they're talking about growth, so they want to grow, they want to have more, but they do not have a, a concept of productivity. That's interesting. How can you have growth without growing productivity? Uh, there's a simple reason, I mean, there's a simple explanation for that. Grab as much as you can. Take it from others. So economics in this sense, in the mercantilist sense, I'm, I'm making it a little bit too sharp here maybe, but is the art of taking, the art of robbery. How to get more from what others seem to share with you. And something is wrong here. Something is fishy here. And I think if you, if you have a look at popular representations of this mode of economic reason, you can see that in the popular image, visual unconscious, as some people would call it, there is a notion that this is wrong, that this is not the right way. Um, this is Aristotle, some pictures that show uh, the notion of flourishing. Uh, oh my god, I skip all this. Here, this is mercantilism in, in modern cinema. Um, I think, hoarding as much as you can. This is the, the chamber, in, in Germany it was called Kameralism, which means the, the chamber where, where the king who collects the taxes has all the gold, right? And here you have the gold. I don't know whether you can see it. This is uh, the little hobbit, and this is Smog the dragon. He lives at the gold. So gold is somehow uh, dangerous, right? Because there's a dragon inside who will eat you. This also is somebody, I don't know whether you know this guy, but he's also a cameralist, right? He's the guy who takes the taxes and collects the money from everybody, but he's bad. He's, he's an evil man. And there's one more. Uh, Robin Hood, this is uh, the Sheriff of Nottingham. He too is a tax collector, right? He does what the mercantilist people were telling him to do, actually. Raise the income of, of the king, but he was doing it by some means that were not inc uh, including productivity growth or something, but just clever means of taking it from other people. Um, so what, what's economics here? What's the meaning of economics in this mercantilist approach? It's about trading, balance of trade, and also of taxing, of course. Terms of trade become important. If you buy cheap and sell dear, you will make a profit. So you will grow, but you don't increase productivity. You just take more. But in order to do so on a regular basis, which is what you want to do, you need to construct 
oppressive structures, so power structures, that institutionalized the unequal exchange, as it was later called, so you need to in install tariffs, price regulations, a bureaucracy that tries to watch over uh, the processes, that supervises, uh, you also need soldiers in case something goes wrong, so that's kind of expensive and it's, it's very uh, oppressive in a certain sense. Mercantilism, as we call this economic doctrine, was a theoretical backbone of colonialism. So not only state building in, uh, in Europe, but also colonialism in the rest of the world. In order to make a profit from trading with the colonies, the colonies were not allowed uh, to sell to other countries, for example. They were not allowed to industrialize. They were only allowed to, to trade uh, with the mother, so-called motherland. Um, so if you want to have a look at um, this more closely, maybe you know this guy, uh, Wallerstein, he, he wrote some really interesting books about that. And I suppose you know. Uh, it's important to see that, um, it's important to see this oppressive element here, because that explains why the next school that follows historically, Adam Smith and the classical school, was received as something quite liberating. It was quality and liberty that's inherent in the liberal classical approach. Something that Marxists tend to forget, in some sense, um, because, of, of course, there's ambivalence here, but ambivalence means it's good and bad sides. And the good side that was received uh, in response to mercantilism, that was Adam Smith could do without all of these oppressive structures. He just said, you don't need them. Economically, they're not productive. So that was, um, that was the main idea. It's important to see this because um, it explains why the following school, the classical economics, was praised as the economics of liberty and equality because it simply did not need these oppressive power structures. However, we will quickly see there also is a dark side to liberal economics, of course. Um, the story is ambivalent. Now I want to try to catch this ambivalence in a certain way. Let me start a look at the classical approach uh, that was hegemonic for centuries, so it's very important to grasp, I think. Not with Adam Smith, but with John Locke. Um, as everybody knows, he more or less invented the labor theory of value, which is also a theory of property. And at the same time, he built upon this base, he built a contractarian superstructure, so he also invented contractarianism and also theory of democracy. So if you do political science, Locke is a very important guy for inventing all of this. Uh, but at the same time, he's also an economist, I would say, at least in a rough sense. In Locke's famous second treatise on government from 1689, we can see how the new economics of liberty, and now the ambivalence starts. At the same time, I could call this a double inscription, <laughs> if I would. At the same time, um, becomes a legitimation of political violence. So we have an economics of liberty that is at the same time justifying violence, expulsion, making people go away from their land. Or uh, the term for that that you might know is, um, I forgot it right now, enclosure, right? Funny enough, it's exactly, how does he do it? What does he do there? It's exactly the term productivity that is doing the job of this, of this double, or of this ambivalence. On the one hand, it's, it's liberating. On the other hand, it again is um, political violence. How does he do it using the term of productivity? Locke juxtaposes two senses of productivity. The one is the natural one we started with. Uh, think of the apple on a tree or the fish in the water. That's a literal, literal one. If you think of Marx fishing and hunting and all of this, that's there in, in Locke. Marx later acknowledges nature <coughs> as the author of this primary productivity, the fish in the water, the apple and so on. That's, that's nature who does it. But even according to Locke, it is work to pick it. Right? So nature produces it, but picking it is already work. Hunting, gathering are uh, economic activities. Um, hence, according to the logic of Locke, people who live on the land not only own the products that they reap, so because they hunt, it's their fish, because they hunt the deer, it's their deer, um, but also they own the land that they live on simply because they mix, as he calls it, their labor with the land. So it's their land. So far, so good. That's the property theory of, no, the, the, the labor theory of property, right? However, there are other people, and this is where the problem starts, who are productive in the other sense. So the two, two notions of productivity, like apple tree and technology, come into conflict here. 
These other people are productive in the other sense. They increase productivity by private property. And it's only here that the labor theory of value takes off. So it's only applicable to these other people, right? The labor theory of value is an instrument of expulsion. That means driving people off the land. Or rather of the legitimation of this expulsion. For in the last instance, it's only this second sort of people that has a right to private property. The reason for this is that the first culture of protection, as I will call it, um, is not relying on private, but rather on common property. The land that bears the fruit belongs to everybody. However, the other culture of productivity that relies on the concept of privatization, um, and privatization literally means robbing, right? If you, take the, uh, if you take the Latin term, that means taken away. Private property means common property transformed into private property, and that means I have to exclude the others who were using it before. <laughs> and I was going to show you... Um, because that sounds prehistorical. From Marx, you know that he calls it the ursprüngliche um, Akkumulation, the first accumulation that happened in prehistory. But there are some interesting movies out uh, at the moment who show that this is not at all prehistorical. It's, it's a very actual process. You know that David Harvey and these people call this uh, not land grabbing, but um, accumulation by dispossession. Uh, but these movies that I'm mentioning, um, one is called Land Grabbing, and the other one is called uh, Buena Vida. Do you want to see the trailer, or you want to look it up yourself? I think I don't have the I don't have acoustics here, so I, I just mentioned the names. So the labor theory of value allows to reframe this robbery. So it's a robbery. Privatization of common land is a robbery because it takes away land that was common and now no longer is common um, as something that is not stealing. Usually, in the common sense understanding, privatization means stealing, because you take it away. In the end of Locke's story, the people who live in the other, first sustainable culture of production, uh, of production now they are the ones who steal. So it's, he's doing some magic, political magic, by introducing a political theory of production or productivity that turns the table completely. And how does he do that? Uh, first of all, Locke says that in the value of the products that are produced by private property owners, 90% and I think you know these passages, right? 90% come from labor. That's the labor theory of value. The product from, from land is not from the land, but from labor. 90% comes from labor. That means that the wealth that these people produce on the land that they took is not taken from anybody. It's not stealing. It's producing something that wasn't there before. It's productive, right? So if something is produced new, you cannot have taken it away possibly because it wasn't there before. Uh, it's a pretty, well straightforward argument. That means that the wealth that these people produce is not taken from the former owners, be it peasants as in England, or Native Americans as in America, uh, who appear very prominently in Locke's book, simply because what they own now was not there before. It's a new product, not taken from the same tree. Right? However, this argument is not fully convincing. So you can see that there's a break. You could, if you read that, you can see that, OK, uh, I see the point, but somehow this doesn't work because it only covers 90%. Um, even though Locke wants to downplay these 90% to 99 or 99.9% uh, that goes to labor, not to land. Nevertheless, in legal terms, robbery remains robbery. Even if you reinvest your prey productively after the deed and earn more money with it. So if I take 1,000 euros from some of you and then take it to the bank and earn 5,000 with that, I still took 1,000 from you. It doesn't change the fact. Um, that's why Thomas Paine, I think, very interesting reaction to Locke uh, 100 years later, in an essay called Agrarian Justice, demanded that these 10% that are coming from land that belong to everybody should be paid back to the population in form of an unconditional basic income. And I think that is a very smart move because it's not coming, like the argument for basic income is not coming from some space alien theory that is not connected to liberalism, but it's coming from the core of liberalism. The founding document of liberal economics has this 10% robbery in it, and basic income only tells us to repay the debt. And that's, I think that's a smart move. So in a nutshell, back to Locke, the argument is that the class that's more productive than the other, 10 times as much, according to Locke, has a right to redistribute existing property structures. So property titles are not stable, if you own something but don't use it productively, or not as productively as I do, then I might simply take away your property. 
And that tells us that the term expropriation is not communist, it's a capitalistic uh, invention in a certain sense. If you look at it from a mathematical perspective, now comes the question, why do these people who are driven away from their land are uh, the robbers? How can, how can you claim that they are robbing something? Well, it's a mathematical game. It's a mathematical game. Um, if I could produce a thousand units of value on your land, whereas you only produce a hundred, that means that you, as long as you stay on that land, steal 900 units value from the community. If you let me do it, I will repay everybody in 10, 10 times the amount. So that means you're robbing them of 500 units. The argument is pretty mathematically, it doesn't make sense, right? Hence, you are an obstacle to the common good if you stay on that land, and I can take away your property very well, and also I cannot only take it, but it's in the general interest that I take it, right? I am the actor of the, of the general interest of the common good. Of course, this story does not hold water at a second look because these 900 units are not in the general interest if you have a look at how they are used later on. If it's privately uh, appropriated, then nobody has a benefit, only this guy has a benefit. But uh, the common goods uh, story was one of the main legitimative narratives, I think. Um, in other words, Cutting a long story short, the concept of productivity legitimizes seizures in unequal power structures. And that's why the concept itself has become so contested and remains to be so. And like in a vulgar, materialistic textbook, you can see, now if you go on in the history of economics, that each class has its own economic theory, that sounds a little simplistic here, but I think there's some truth to it, that tries to prove its own productivity, like as a class, we are the productive class. And hence, with this claim to productivity, it claims to uh, not only the social product, but also to power, influence <coughs> and power. And the latest example for this, like the class struggle in economic theory that really wants to uh, grab some of the wealth, is the creative class, I think. Richard Florida and all of these uh, narratives about creativity and how we all are creative, but uh, in, in the last instance, I would say it's about productivity. The claim that creative labor actually is productive. So we should get the money. So here's an overview of all of these class, uh, classes with their claims of productivity that are reflected <coughs> in, a certain, in a certain economic theory, um, starting with the merchants and mercantilism who demanded that the most influence in the state, including favorable tax regime, provision of an infrastructure and so on, should go to the merchants, which is yeah, pretty clear, simply because they provide the wealth of the nation. We now saw that in Locke, it's the industrial capitalists or at that stage, the industrial farmers who, who legitimize the enclosures and colonialism with the idea of their higher productivity of their assets, right? So we have a shift here already. Now, what, are, what other classes do we have? We have landowners, and you can see that physiocracy, which is a strange name, for, uh, but uh, that's how it's called. Also, Thomas Malthus, who had the same uh, direction, had their productivity claims reflected in economic theory. In early socialism, it's workers, in state, the state bureaucrats, as a class, I would say, they have their interests wrapped up nicely in Keynesianism. I will come to this a little bit later. And finally, you could say that financial capitalists benefited tremendously from neoliberalism. So there's a link to. Um, I will cite um, from a book from Dumenil and Lévy. Um, quote, neoliberalism is the expression of the desire of a class of capitalist owners and the institutions <laughs> in which their power is concentrated which we collectively call finance. So finance capital and neoliberalism also have this, um, you said it, bondage between economic theory and class. So we have a class struggle in economic theory. Um, let's, come to, let's come back to Locke, if you bear with me. If I'm not boring you, I'm going to go back to Locke for just for a little while. Because I think this text is brilliant in order to show how political struggles are reflected in economic texts. And usually that's nothing that you learn in economics, but if you, if you read it from a philosophical angle, you can detect it in a certain way. Uh, so in this text, we can see that the political structural struggles have an impact on the economic text, because enclosures that were happening in the 17th century were, of course, contested. I mean, people taking away the land, driving off the people, and you have homelessness and to a large extent. Of course, that was contested. So you can see that Locke was reacting to this political debate in his text, um, so he brought in some morality. It's always good to be moral, right? The moral person, uh, 
business ethics and all of this. It's in there, but you can see the political structure, uh, uh, the political function. Um, so in the second historical stage, we have the first stage, which is common property of everybody, then we have the second stage, which is private property and productivity. In this second historical stage, um, there seem to exist three moral limits to, uh, uh, to private property. There seem to be three limits, and that's quite influential and interesting story. First rule, don't appropriate more than you can produce with your own hands. Right? Only what you can do yourself. Now the trick here is hand. Double inscription again. Hand also means labor, right? If you have laborers, you can use them <laughs> to appropriate as much as you can. It's still your hands, right? So uh, this is a little fishy here. Second rule, do not appropriate more than you can consume yourself, because otherwise it will rot. If you take more apples than you can eat, they will uh, decay. And that means you steal them from the others because they can't <coughs> eat them. Third rule, only use as much as uh, that there's enough left for the others. So you cannot use all of it. So you should always uh, keep something. That means that for John Locke, who is willing to expel people from their land in order to increase productivity, there seems to be another norm uh, that somehow comes from an egalitarian impulse, equality, equality. However, at a second look or a closer look, the real reason for these limits, moral limits, is itself a question of productivity. So it seems to be morality, but I think it, it again is productivity that is at play here. Because in the third stage, there's a third stage, um, and that's the invention of money. Not only private property, but then comes money. Um, these three moral laws just vanish into thin air. They're gone. And the reason for this is that money is even more protect, uh, productive. Um, money allows to store the gained wealth without a danger of decay. Right? So you cannot, you're not taking away apples, you just store gold and that doesn't decay. So that means you can appropriate and accumulate endlessly. And that means uh, these moral laws are no longer valuable, uh, no longer needed. Um, now it's possible to store endless amounts of wealth without taking away anything or without uh, letting anything rot. That means the moral limits to growth no longer hold due to the superior productivity of money itself. Money increases productivity, so you can do without morals. Now the question is, what the hell is the productivity of money? <laughs> I'm going to come to this in a second, I hope, at least. It's, it seems pretty much like a money fetishism in Marx, that it's a stupid belief that money begets money in itself. But I think there's a little bit more to it. Um, I hope, I hope can show that. Now, chronologically, let's have a look at the theory that invented the term productive labor. So the next step after Locke would be um, Quesnay. This is a French physiocrat from 17, I think, 1750. Um, here's something quite fascinating happens, I think. He invents the term productive labor, uh, but which is linked to productivity, but he links it to nature. I started out that productivity is somehow is not nature. Nature's reproduction and productivity is some kind of technological reason-based thing. Here, the opposite is the case. It is nature that is productive. Um, I'm talking about Kisne's economic table. The term productive labor was used here for agrarian classes. So physiocracy means uh, <laughs> physics is nature, so that means agrarian labor, land, right? farming. In society seen as a whole, and this was his, his, his real contribution to economics, he was not looking at single things, but on the whole of society, and also over time. So it had a dynamic um, dimension. And this is what later economists took from him. So if you have a look at society as a whole, as a system, the nobility owns a lot of money, but spends it without reproducing any of it. That means that they constantly need new inputs. They always need to be fed and new. Every period they need more money, via taxes or via rents or in some way. Their part in the economy is only consumptive. They only take, they only use up. So the word earning becomes a new meaning here because they have a lot of money but they don't earn it. And that's uh, in some way a legitimation to take it away from them, right? They're not earning it. Um, they own a lot of money but they don't earn it simply because they do not produce anything in return. So in the tableau economique, uh, we have to count their expenses as losses. And that's in neoclassical economics, it's different because everybody who spends money that's an economic transaction is automatically productive because it's uh, 
economic exchange, right? Here, it's a minus. You have to deduct it from the social product because it's waste. It's, it's not productive, it's consumptive. Um, I have a little footnote, I'm going to skip it. Or should I bring it? Uh, yesterday, I wrote something in a Swiss newspaper about female academics, and it was the same argument that they are not productive. They, they cost a lot because all of them are well educated, and that costs a lot of money. But then they get children and never go back to work. And that's why I, they are only consuming. <laughs> the same as the nobility in their old age, and now we have these educated women. It's weird because you think, what's, what's the point of this? Either you have, have to force the women to go to work in order to repay uh, what their studies were costing the community or uh, don't educate them. Very, very dangerous argument, I think, but nevertheless, footnote closed. There's another class of society that does produce something, and for Cosnay, these are the merchants, the technicians, manual workers, and so on. They produce something, but they also spend something, and in the end, that equals out, so they are neutral, or he calls it sterile, right? They produce something, but they also use up something, and it adds up to zero, so they are only reproductive. That means, um, yeah, reproductive. A society that only has these two classes would not be sustainable, because if we add, is zero to a loss, we still have the loss. Uh, so what we need now is a, a productive class that covers the losses, right? that pays for the losses that we have here. Um, and Marx would say that what this third class needs to produce is not merely products, production and products seem to be equivalent, but surplus value. So productivity is about surplus in terms of value, that is more output in terms of value than input. In other words, Marx and Smith and Ricardo and all of these people were taking their grammar, so to speak, from Kisney, because he started this game. Um, now, the term productivity or product, productive labor is quite sophisticated. It's not easy because you need the whole of this totality, not totalitarian, sorry, uh, totality, right? The term of totality, the whole society. You have to look at the whole society first be before you can tell whether an activity is productive or not. And that's another difference to neoclassical economics. Um, in neoclassical economics, if you earn one million euro by playing tennis for half an hour, um, you measure the labor output ratio, that's how they call it, right? You, you work for a certain amount and then you see how much you earn. That's very high. For half an hour of tennis, one million, well, wow, that's very productive labor. Um, but for a physicist, it's not so clear, because the match itself, uh, like Boris Becker or somebody, does not produce anything, so you technically could call it consumption. It's luxury consumption. You spend a part of your income on a ticket that allows you to watch the game, but after the game the money's burned. There's nothing left. So it's purely consumption, or luxury consumption, and that doesn't add anything to the society's wealth. So from a perspective of uh, physiocratic, you could call this, which is very productive, in neoclassical economics, consumption, which is a loss, a loss to society. Uh, that makes it complicated. Um, now you may wonder, in order to get out of this physiocratic uh, story, why is it physiological activity, that is something physical, um, that's supposed to be productive in that sense, that it covers the losses of other classes? How is that possible? Because usually you would say that natural activity is some kind of reproductive, that means Neutral, right? Not, not adding something. The one reason why uh, he thinks that is the case is substantialist. Is a substantialist logic. Um, without grain, no bakers, right? Bakers transform <coughs> flour into into bread. They are not productive because they are only transforming, right? That's why they are still real. But the one, the ones who provide the grain, they are productive because the grain is out of nowhere, out of the blue. So that means bakery neutral. Uh, farmer productive, right? That's a substantialist logic, and uh, you can see that this does not really do the job because you can make the same argument without growth. You can have a stable economy where you have agriculture, but nothing's going to change forever. But this productivity has the notion of change, surplus, something is going to happen, something is growing, and that doesn't do the... The substantialist reading does not do that job. So the real catch of the argument is growth-oriented, it's the agrarian workers who know best how to increase the productivity of the soil. That's the thing. That's the real argument. The real productivity is the surplus that we get over time. If we compare this year's output to last year's output, uh, then we have a growth. And here we see the political dimension of the term productivity, finally, again, also in uh, these writers. 
only if these productive workers who know best how to increase uh, the social product have enough elbow room, that is low taxes, bulk of the resources that they produce coming back to them and finding the political power to appropriate more and more land. Here we're back at the enclosures, by the way. Only if they get all this, they can unfold the productivity that Kisne is after and that the society needs in order to thrive. So we see that what seems to be a descriptive science in reality is a political program that is articulating demands. We should get the power. Then we can be productive and then the society will flourish. Otherwise you will have stability or degrowth. So, politically this proved to be quite ambivalent. If you, if you have a look at this story, then okay, agrarian labor is the one that increases productivity because they know how to increase the social product. Um, what does it mean politically? Either it could bind, very ambivalent thing, it could bind the unproductive rulers, kings, noblemen and so on, with their most productive subjects and form an agrarian monarchy. So kings and peasants <coughs> together are melting in a certain sense. That's the German way to read that. Or it can raise the French revolutionary question, why should we feed this unproductive and wasteful minority in the first place? If it's proven that they're unproductive, we don't need them, right? Should get away. I mean, go away. Let them go away. Let's get rid of them. Uh, Saint-Simon was having the same point <coughs> later. So you can see that this transforms into body in socialism. Either way, the question, which class is the most productive one in society, was one of prime political importance ever since. Now I'm jumping to Adam Smith. Um, we can see that once we know what Kisne was doing, uh, he only needed to apply a very small change. <coughs> it took him hundreds of pages in The Wealth of Nations, if you look that up. Uh, he's dealing with the physiocratic uh, school. Uh, but the point is quite simple, I think. It's not the agrarian labor itself that is productive in this growth sense, increasing the social product. In fact, agrarian societies can be very static and resistant to change, rather, it's the intellectual and organizational effort that is uh, doing the job in order to make agrarian labor more productive. But uh, this effort, like intellectual um, increase or technical increase, um, is in no way restricted to agrarian fields only. Um, we find this very meaning of dynamic productivity, namely increasing outputs in terms of value over time at the core of the wealth of nations. And that's, of course, division of labor. So he takes this idea of increasing outputs from agrarian labor and puts it to industrial capitalism and says, this is actually the real productivity, divide your labor. Division of labor is something that needs to be done permanently. Once you start it, you need to continue doing it, otherwise you will be outcompeted. Right? If you start the game, you have to run and run and run. But what is it that you do? What does it mean, division of labor? The labor you, let's imagine you're a capitalist, uh, command more or less does the same. I mean, if you tell somebody what to do this, he's going to do this all the time, in Adam Smith's theory. Uh, so what you need to do, make him more productive. How do you do that? Uh, well, productive in the second sense, right? Um, you divide the labor and hence increase the unit output per hour worked. That means productivity, right? Every worker that you pay produces more. Uh, in, in order to do this, you need four things, I think. Um, a, a certain amount of money, because division of labor is, cost, it is a cost factor, so you need money. B, you need some machinery, fixed capital, constant capital, um, in order to technically divide the labor process, so you need machinery here and there and there. Um, C, you need uh, an industry that pr provides the machinery, because machinery doesn't fall from the sky, so there needs to be a whole industry. And D, you need some kind of intellectual labor that designs the machines or the revised production process in the first place. All of this is necessary in order to have this um, division of labor. But all of these increase productivity, so we can say in the Smithian sense that they are productive in an indirect sense because they increase productivity. Right? That's where the notion that capital is productive comes from. They increase productivity of labor, so that's an indirect sense, but nevertheless it's very um, evident that Adam Smith had this idea and convinced other people. So what exactly means productivity here? In the last instant, it's labor that's productive, of course. Um, labor produces both the output and also the surplus value, so the profit of the capitalism. Um, but providing machinery is also productive, hence it earns a profit um, because it increases productivity. B, advancing money is also productive, that it's a legitimation for interest. 
uh, on financial capital. And intellectual and immaterial labor is also productive, um, at least as long as it uh, leads to increases in productivity, right? Cultural, science, cultural sciences and history and all of this, of course, is not productive because it doesn't have a, a link to production. Um, well, I had something on David Ricardo. I think I'm, I'm taking much too long. Um, so we see that, on the one hand, Adam Smith has this notion of productivity of capital and productivity of uh, intellectual labor, even. But that does not mean that everything is productive. He still maintains this distinction between productive and unproductive labor. There's a very um, popular quote that you might know that, um, should I write, should I read that? Uh, the labor of a manufacturer adds to, uh, well, basically the point is, if you employ productive laborers, you get rich. If you employ unproductive laborers, which means servants who don't produce anything, just do something, uh, to you, scratch your back or something, you will get poor. And the same that's uh, valid for an individual capitalist is also valid for the whole economy. So we should take care that we invest our social assets or the social wealth into productive areas. That's why we need economics, because economics tells us what's productive. And in Ricardo, we can see that he still uses that same notion of productive and unproductive labor in his crisis theory. Uh, Ricardo has a theory of a falling rate of profit, interestingly. Um, and he attributed that um, to the rising uh, part of the social product that went into unproductive areas. It's going, that's a theory of ground rent, very, very complicated thing, but in the end it explains why more and more of the social product goes from industrial capitalist to ground rent, and ground rent is unproductive, and that's why we will have um, a big crisis, product profitability crisis in the end. Um, and some would say this Ricardian argument, again, reappears, much of that historical stuff refaces. Um, some would repeat this argument in times of financialization for rising profits from financial capital, that's the argument, may not be reflected by any real-world equivalents, and hence should also count as a loss or as a robbery. The bank makes profit but doesn't produce anything, so that should be counted as a robbery, just as, uh, or just a uh, consumption, just as uh, ground rent was counted as a loss in Ricardo. Now, to wrap up, Marx is missing. <laughs> I'm going to skip Marx. I think we should do that in the discussion, because I talked too long already. But I would briefly like to mention in which way Keynesianism and neoliberalism fit into this picture. I talked a lot about old stories, but these newer ones uh, are maybe more interesting. If you can follow me so far and distinguish three kinds of productivity, that is reproduction or simple production of use values, that is you cook something for yourself. Second is production of surplus value, that is an excess of outputs over inputs in terms of exchange values. And then the third meaning, which is also implicit in the, th in the second, growth or an increase in productivity over time. Um, then the third use of productivity, I think, is the most relevant in order to understand Keynes and uh, what came afterwards. Keynes' claim was, as you remember, that the system is intrinsically unstable. So like his name, he has a view on the system, macroeconomics as it's called today. Um, but for him, there's no guarantee that the system supplies enough s profitability, hence enough opportunities for investments. If you don't have these investments, you don't have enough jobs and income for everybody. So that's uh, a, a lack in the system. So what can you do here? Keynes transferred the liberal idea of profitability of money and capital, or I should rather say producti uh, productivity of money and capital, in a smart way towards the government. Now it's the government who is productive in that sense. The government can be productive in the dynamic understanding, increasing productivity, by bridging the system, bringing the system back to its growth path, by investing at times of crisis and providing the jobs that the system itself no longer delivers. And the system, uh, the, the idea of the multiplier, if you came across that, I mean, that's, that's a, like a miracle of productivity because um, you invest one million and you get four million. It's profit rate of 400% or it, uh, the productivity rise five times. Um, so strictly speaking, now the government who's doing that magic of the multiplier is the most productive force. 
in this whole society. That's, that's a weird claim, but I think that's what's at play here. This way, I said in the beginning, Keynesianism can be read as an expression of the bureaucratic or political class interest, because they claim, with Keynesianism, that their part in society, or their class's uh, interests, are really the productive ones. Right? If the state invests more money, then the whole economy can be more productive. And we are the state, so we are the ones. Now, what's the monetarist answer to that? It also is, uh, can be spelled out in terms of productivity. At least one of the criticisms of Keynes was the kind of investment that governments would make, namely uh, those that the market would not make, are due to be economically unproductive. So whatever the state does, it's not going to be productive, so the, the whole story of Keynesianism doesn't take off, because the state will invest in childcare, in health institutions, in free education, in social insurance, and all of, this, all of these are unproductive, uh, unproductive fields. So whenever you invest there, um, you will not have growth, and hence you will not have increased productivity. The alternative would be that you invest in um, private areas, but then you will have the crowding out effect, and likewise you will not increase productivity. Though, So the whole criticism of uh, Keynes and the monetarian and uh, monetaristic school is also based um, on the notion of productive labor, surprisingly. Not the whole, but a lot of it. Now, if you take the wealth of this debate over the centuries, there are so many positions here, um, it's hard to find an economic answer that would do justice to all the different approaches. Now, if we step back and say, like, who's right in this debate? Which class is really the productive one? I think that's a very hard, that's a very hard one. Um, I don't know the answer. Um, instead, what you find particularly in critical theories today, I think, and that's a move I would support, is just skip the answer, don't give an answer to that question, and rather uh, retreat from the, the last two understandings of the term productivity, that is productive of surplus value, and uh, productive in the meaning of raising productivity or growth, back to the first one. That's something that you can see at very different uh, books and conferences. I'm not thinking about feminist economics. I mean, that was part of, they did the same thing, reproductive activities of the household. I think that's ambivalent because it assumes that women belong to the household. That's something nobody would claim today. But it was about this first use of the term productivity, which is production of use values. I rather think of writers like Erich Fromm, Herbert Marcuse, or even Deleuze, who all stress that the prime importance and something we should remember today is production of use values. Productivity in the simple first meaning of the term. Many things do have a use value and are very important for a good life that are not reflected in economic numbers, so we might have a good life even without economic growth. That's something that I'm working on at the moment. We had a big conference on good life after growth. Um, so what is, what is example for this are free time, friends, family, open space in the city, but also health, less chemicals in the water, um, whatever. You can read that in, for example, Skidelsky. I think that's one of the examples where you can find it, the good life uh, without economic growth. Um, the question that I would have is, um, what would be the economic conditions for that? I mean, how could we have a, an economy that is based on this notion of productivity in the maybe romantic sense or maybe in, the, in this use value sense? Not quite sure how that would look like, and I would be happy to debate that with you. And I think I should stop here. I, yeah. <laughs> many, many words. Uh, yeah, thank you, Christoph. Any questions now? <laughs> um, okay, maybe I can. Uh, you mentioned Skidelsky just now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you think it's possible, the return of the master? <laughs> Keynesianism now? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is it possible in Europe? Like, could we do that? I mean, <laughs> we have some initiatives, but what the fuck is something similar? I don't know. What do you think? Oh, that's a hard one. <laughs> is it possible? Um, I mean, we had it. Um, that would be a question that has to go into the history of uh, of um, real economics, not the history of like thinking about economics, but the history of what what was done. And for example, I think we had this comeback of Keynesianism with the 
You know, the Abfahrt Prämie of, uh, in Germany, they were spending a lot of money in order to make people buy cars, right? So you, you would actually get money if you throw away your, if your old car and buy a new one, and that's a kind of uh, government spending. I mean, you, but it's put into the private sector, and so far it didn't have a, a big effect. So, um, and I think the Skidelsky thing is it's quite interesting because uh, it's been written by father and son, right? And the father is this Keynes biographer, and the son is an Aristotelian philosopher. And I don't, I don't think that these two parts of the book really meet uh, or match. Because um, having the good life without growth, I mean, Keynes is all about growth. He wants to fuel the economy and bring, uh, bring the growth path back in. And Skidels, the other Skidels, the son is talking about um, the good life without it. So I don't really see how the one is connected to the other. But one very important question that I, um, I cannot really answer is, um, because we are debating this growth uh, thing in Jena and in Erfurt all the time, in, could you actually have capitalism without growth? I mean, would, would the system fall apart or would, um, would that be sustainable? Because if we, if we could sustain that, you could have like the sun story of the good life with friendships and relations to nature and all of this and have a clean economy that's based on Keynesian non-growth economics and everybody would be happy. But the question is, is that possible? Okay, any questions? Yeah, I think it's um, useful to go um, back to Adam Smith um, with this uh, question, you know, of uh, the good life, because I think that's um, an important part in history. Because I, I think uh, Adam Smith didn't really put up a convincing argument, uh, you know, about uh, division of labor increasing productivity. Mm -hmm. um, okay, on a general level, because he had multiple notions of uh, uh, division of labor. You know, the one is, of course, on, on the level of society, where, where it does make some sense. You know, I cannot be a good doctor if I go, you know, do, do the job uh, tomorrow, okay? But on the level of the individual factory, for example, the task he describes in his famous, you know, pin factory example, those are extremely basic tasks. And the point was, you know, laborers had to be, you know, disposable. Um, so the tasks had to be broken down to very, you know, uh, simple mechanisms that anybody could really learn, you know, women, the children who were entering the, the workforce. Um, so when we're talking about productivity, and Adam Smith doesn't make this distinction, of course, um, it would be a bad idea for him, you know, between increasing productivity by, you know, achieving more with the same input and increasing productivity by achieving more with more input. Meaning that, you know, one part of this reorganization, uh, you know, first in manufacturers and then in factories, uh, was, of course, it was always about control, about authority. Uh, so how much you know, of the increased productivity was because now the capitalist could control labor, uh, had control over labor and could dictate uh, the working conditions uh, first you know, through more uh, personal interventions and then you know, through machinery as you know, Marx described the worker becoming just you know, an appendix of, of the machine. Uh, but basically forcing workers to work more, you know, not like uh, in crafts where the worker, if he produced enough so that his needs were met, that you know, he could survive, could just stop working and go fishing. Now, you know, he could choose between starving to death um, and working. You know? So this, this choice, I think, you know, between... Uh, You know, between use values and you know, the quality of life being subjugated to productivity is um, historically specific. You know, there's a system that uh, reproduces this, and I think it's what, what uh, Adam Smith uh, described in this um, division of labor that's um, an important uh, piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Oh, you raised interesting points. I mean, the one is with this increased inputs, uh, or not increased inputs, I think. Uh, the interesting thing is that you need to increase inputs, of course. You need to invest at first. So you have a lot of money that you have to spend in order to save money. That's why some people say, um, I'm too poor to save, right? Because in order to save, you need to spend first. But um, this input in the large picture leads to uh, less 
how can I say that, less input uh, per unit, right? Because you can produce more, that means the actual capital input per each unit, if you can produce a thousand pins instead of ten, that means that you have to divide uh, the total input that is growing through a thousand, not until, uh, through ten, and that means uh, it levels out. At least that's the uh, that's the way that they mathematically expect it, right? They they hope it's going to level out, and there has this price mechanism, and it's never sure whether that really works. But you have rising input, but at the same time uh, shrinking input, and that's sometimes confusing. And about this, whether that was a question or a comment, I'm not quite sure. But um, you have these two sides of what division of labor really means. One is political control, oppression, right? Surveillance, like in Foucault. I'm looking at you and I'm trying to tell you what to do. But I think that presupposes, in a certain way, that I also have the technical control of what you actually do. And you can see that uh, one way to restore power, even now in modern factories, is um, to reform the labor process over and over and over again. Because if it stays the same uh, for a while, that means that workers gain um, the expertise how to do it, and they know better than management what to do. So they also know how to uh, get some freedom for themselves, right? Have a break and nobody notices it or slow down the process or something. So in order to regain the control, you have to, it doesn't, it's not enough to say, I'm the man in power, because if you don't oversee the process, you don't have the power actually. So that means you have to have uh, the control of the technology too at the same time. So I, I wouldn't say that it's, 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 I would say it's two sides of the same coin. Division of labor means technology, but also increased power. Okay, any other questions? Otherwise, I would just uh, <coughs> invite you to the next week's lecture. Chris O'Kane will be lecturing on the topic of production in critical theory. And uh, so, welcome and take some materials there. And thank you again, Christopher. Oh, no questions? No more questions? <laughs> I was prepared to talk for an hour now, and I didn't give away the marks in, but maybe you heard that many times. You heard a lot about marks. Okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs>